from that he came up with an idea of, uh, of fundamental units for mass, length and time. And the unit of length is called the Planck length. And it goes like this, mathematically it goes like this. Now, it's really quite hard to give you a very good physical insight into this, but there's a slightly heuristic argument you can use, which is, I don't think it really gives many more insights than Planck's original idea. So let's just write down the three constants then. Okay. Here's Planck's constant, h, or as it's sometimes written, h upon 2 pi, which we signify like this. This is big G, the gravitational constant, that tells us why gravity is as strong as it is, why the Earth has got its, its, its uh, strength of gravity on the surface, or it, of course, big G and the mass of the Earth determines the orbiting of the Moon around the Earth. And then the other constant is uh, C. Now, the curious thing is, if you multiply H bar and G, and then divide by C cubed, the cube C, that gives you the square of a length, or if you like, an area, and that's called the Planck length. So the Planck length, if we now take square roots and want the length itself, we take the square root of that quantity and that then gives me the Planck length. And that length is very, very small. It's about 10 to the minus 35 meters. So uh, 1 over 10, 1 over 1 with 35 noughts after it. You know the sort of thing I mean. Let me write it down. And do, you have to, do I have to do all these 35 of them? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so on, and 35 of those zeros. So that's how big it is in meters. A very, very small length. Professor, is, that, is there an actual use? I mean, I could take any three famous constants and make an equation out of them and come up with a number. What's special about this? What a great question. I was hoping you asked me that. In fact, I, I forgot to mention it to you before we, you started switching on the camera. Now, what's really interesting, all this, Planck uh, put all this stuff out in a paper in 1889, and unbeknown to him, uh, an Irish physicist, one of these people who was not as well known as he deserves to be, a chap called Stoney, and I think we've talked about him before on 60 Symbols, uh, he came up with a separate uh, uh, method of getting a fundamental length scale. And at this time, just that 10 years earlier, there was no, no such thing about quantum ideas. Quantum ideas hadn't started yet. And Stoney came up with a new set of length, uh, length scales. And it works like this. So if we take the Planck length, let's start from the Planck length and work backwards, and we see how Stoney got the Planck length without, uh, got his length scale uh, from the Planck length uh, without introducing Planck's constant. So we've got this. Now, there's another wonderful constant that I love, and this is the fine structure constant, alpha, which is equal to 1 over 130 sem to a very good approximation. And this is equal to, let me put an h bar there, in ordinary units. Uh, I, if I'm using SI units, I should put a 4 pi in here, but if we use old-fashioned units, we can do this. Now, if you take those two relations, you can see that if I multiply alpha by LP squared, h up top here, h down the bottom here, they cancel. And if I do that and multiply those things together, so alpha times L Planck squared is just equal to h bar g upon cq times e squared over h bar c. And now look, we get rid of that quantum thing, and now we've got a new length scale. We take a square root of this, and our new length scale is then just given by the square root of the gravitational constant, the square of the electrical charge, and over c to the fourth. So that's just equal to g e squared over c to the fourth. So you can introduce a fundamental length scale without invoking uh, Planck's constant. Uh, and there it is. And that length scale is actually a little bit smaller than the Planck length. Now again, let me just remind you that if we take the Planck length and put all the numbers in for it, there's the Planck length. I've already written it down. If we do that, there's the Planck length. And so the stony length is about the square root of alpha smaller than that, so that's something like 10 to the minus 36 meters. Now, what does it all mean physically? Well, of course, this is, this, what it's telling us is that perhaps if we take quantum mechanics and gravity into account, space itself is not really properly defined on length scales smaller than the Planck length. Maybe space-time gets foamy, as they say, on these sorts of length scales, and then all the particle physics guys and uh, these cosmologists start worrying about their ideas of bubble universes springing out, out of the Planck length. But you better go and talk to a cosmologist. Go and talk to Ed Copeland about that, 
or, or, or maybe Mike Merrifield, and they'll give you their views about it. So this is all a little bit mysterious cosmology. Okay, now the, the other thing is slight, I think, always think is slightly unsatisfactory with the Planck length, and the stony length as well for that matter, is actually given by this uh, square root relation. And, you know, if you wanted to define a length scale, having these square roots in here is a little bit, what I, feel, I personally feel a bit uncomfortable with that. But the interesting thing is that if you take the Planck area, let's go back to the back, let's square up again, take the Planck area, and now we consider a black hole, then as we know, a black hole, there it is, there's our black hole, and a black hole, uh, according uh, to uh, particle people and cosmologists, so, sorry, uh, okay, so I'll stop yeah. again. And, and here's my black hole. Now, if you believe Hawking, or black, Hawking had the idea that a black hole has no hair, like me, or not very much, but actually a black hole has got hair, it's got three properties, and its properties are its mass, its charge, and its angular momentum, L, uh, the momentum associated with any, any spin that it's got. And uh, if we look at a black hole, we can identify something w from the black hole, which is called uh, the event horizon. And the event horizon has a certain radius to it. And of course, anything that gets in beyond the event horizon can never escape. Once you've hit the event horizon, you can never get out again. You'd say goodbye to your friends. Uh, you don't know what's happening, but you, but you get no more, more, your friends can't see you anymore and get information out. Now, if you take the event horizon of, of a black hole, uh, and, and its radius, then you can define a, a, an area of that, that's 4 pi r squared. That's the radius of, uh, that's the area of, uh, of, of the, the surface area of a volume uh, with this uh, event horizon. Then if we work out the event horizon of a black hole and then divide by uh, the uh, Planck, uh, the, the square of the Planck length, which is also uh, an area, then this gives us the entropy of the black hole. And the entropy really just tells us how much information has got lost inside the black hole due to its things have fallen into it, all that information, there may be tons of books from lost civilizations or whatever, or complicated atoms, or maybe even astronauts have fallen into it at some point later on in the universe. Then that tells us how much information has gone into the black hole. So you've got this rather beautiful relation. The, the Planck area comes in and tells you the entropy of a black hole. So there is a practical use for this Planck length? Well, if you're a, a cosmologist or a particle physicist, I have to say in my everyday work on semiconductors, I don't use it too much. But it's great to think about because it's such a small length. Uh, small, yeah, it? it's ex now the other thing to remember: ten to the minus thirty-five. It's easy for us to write that number down. It's an extremely small length. But what does ten to the minus thirty-five meters mean? Well, that means it's ten to the power twenty times smaller than the proton uh, that makes up the hydrogen atom. So even on the scale of, of one of these smallest things that I feel I can imagine, something like a, a proton radius, this thing is twenty orders of magnitude smaller than that. So very small indeed. Is there any particle or anything that is that small? Uh, well, we, we don't know. Uh, nobody's got it, got, got there and studied that because to look at things on this scale, you need extremely high energies uh, and uh, we don't know how to make accelerators of that sort of length scale. So this, maybe, this, maybe we'll know more about that when we understand the early universe, but with our present day technology and even future technology, we're unlikely to be able to probe on those lengths. There's one curious thing about the Planck length, that once I've got a length scale, I can get a mass, and Planck would have been aware of this as well, that we can make a mass. And the Planck mass is just given by h upon the Planck length times c. Now, have a guess what that, that, that mass is. I mean, you might think that that mass is, um, is also very, maybe very small or, or very large. But actually, it's, 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 it's very curious. It turns out that it's about 10 to the minus 8 kilograms, let's put the minus in, So, which is about the size of a sm very small grain of, of sand or a large dust particle. So this is a, a very ordinary mass that we can, you know, look, we can actually see a, if, it, if it were a grain of sand with that mass, we'd see it under a microscope or, or under a magnifying lens. So this Planck mass, rather curious. And of course, the reason uh, this works out like this is that the, uh, the Planck length may be uh, very small and it's in the denominator, so that's going to tend to make things large. But we're multiplying here by Planck's constant, and we know the quantum mechanics is a, is, is, is a process uh, that is a, we're a little bit unfamiliar at these large length scales. And 
and orbiting planets and so on, and pens dropping under gravity, uh, we can forget about Planck's constant. And quantum effects are relatively subtle, and this is a small number, so that kind of fights against this uh, even smaller number in the denominator, giving us a mass which we've got a kind of a feeling, feeling on. Only one hundred thousandths of a gram. So that's your Planck mass.